and sa ating Facebook, Endeavor Here from Christ is the Head Fellowship. We welcome you everyone today and we thank you, thank God for today that we're all here and I still have the liberty to preach the gospel and share to you the message of our living Lord. So today we have a very special speaker. We thank God for his availability and continue to be a blessing to us. And I hope that he'll be a blessing to you and the word that will be coming from the Holy Spirit and this word through our brother's servant, leader, Giorgio Regaliza. Welcome, Giorgio. Now take the floor for your message of Thy Kingdom Come. Yes, thank you for that introduction. Good morning, everybody. Magandang umaga po sa inyong lahat. My topic for today that I'll be sharing this Sunday is titled Thy Kingdom Come. Okay, so I hope we're, we're all ready to receive what the uh what God has um I guess prepared for us to receive in this message this morning. And so I'll just do a quick prayer. So dear Heavenly Father, I just wanna thank you once again for being here with us as a as a body of Christ, Lord God. I just pray, Lord, that as I deliver your message, Lord I just want you to increase, Lord God, as I decrease, Lord Father, that, Lord, the words that you are going to speak through my voice, Lord God, that your spirit will just, Lord God, minister to everybody here listening, whether it be in the Zoom or on Facebook Live, Father God. We just pray that our hearts will be receptive and we'll be able to grow more with you. And in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so as I mentioned, our topic this morning is titled Thy Kingdom Come. Now, I'm sure you're already aware of where this um, topic is going towards. And the main, I guess the main passage of scripture that I'll be touching on is obviously the Lord's Prayer, where he mentions, you know, Thy Kingdom Come, Thy Will Be Done. And first we'll be going through just the the origins of the the meaning of the kingdom of god and what that's what that has what the scripture has um spoken about regarding the kingdom okay so i hope you can um join me along this ride of understanding what the kingdom of god is uh, in the passage of scripture, in the Bible, in the word of God, as well as what it means for us as believers in today's world. So let's go ahead, shall we? Okay. So we'll, we come touch based on the origins and the meaning of the kingdom of God. So we see a clear picture in the gospel from the coming of Jesus Christ to establish his kingdom through the whole story of redemptive history and the church. So that's basically the, the whole basis of Jesus coming to earth and establishing God's kingdom once again down to earth as it originally was when God created um, mankind basically. And, which was the original intention of God. And so the kingdom of God is mentioned as well in different ways in the Old and New Testaments. So we'll just go through a few of the verses here. It says here in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. I'm sure you're familiar with this verse as well. It says, But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. And then we also read in Mark chapter 1, verses 14 to 15. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. And then it says here in Luke chapter 4, and verse 33, but he said, 
I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also because that is why I was sent. So this is referring to the kingdom of Christ in these passages of scripture. And then the other, I guess, the different way that um, the kingdom of uh, God is mentioned here in Matthew chapter 13, verse 41 which reads, the Son of Man will send out his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all the things that offend and those who practice lawlessness. And then in Matthew chapter 20, verse 21, it says, and he said to her, what do you wish? She said to him, grant that these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right hand and the other on the left in your kingdom. So both of these passages of scripture is referring to the kingdom of Christ and the kingdom of God. And then in, we see here in, Math, in Mark chapter 11, verse 10, it says here, Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. So it's referring to the kingdom that obviously it's, also referring to the kingdom of God, but also referring to the um, the kingdom during David's time, where which is actually correlates to what the kingdom of God was actually being embodied and emphasized through King David. And then uh, we also read in Matthew chapter three, verse two. It says, "And saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand." And then also it says on verses 4 to 17, from that time Jesus began to preach and to say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So we, we see like a continuous repetition of Jesus saying that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Um, so also in chapter 8 verses 12, and this is a bit of a contrast as well. It says here that, but the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So I think this is probably referring to, I guess, those that have been fallen um, from heaven. And when they were cast out into darkness with Satan, and they were originally from the kingdom of heaven. And then now they were cast down into darkness. Um, so that's what those verses are trying to highlight there, that the kingdom of God is also referring to the kingdom of heaven. So just to summarize here, that the different wording between um, the kingdom of Christ, the kingdom of God, and the kingdom of heaven, they all, all the scriptures embody the, si the same concept, but with different aspects. So essentially yeah, the passages of scripture that we read referring, referring to the kingdom of Christ, the kingdom of Christ and God, the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, the, they, although they are different aspects, they all embody the same concept, which is essentially the kingdom of God that they are all referring to here. And then we move on to the, the very origins of the kingdom of God, um, referring to looking back on the creation of man and the creation of earth in Genesis, which I'm sure we're all familiar of. Um, and it's basically the thing that we can sort of, we can gather from this passage that I'm about to read is that we were actually called to have dominion over the earth. When God had created man and woman, we were actually responsible to rule and have dominion over God's kingdom on earth. And it says here to emphasize this more is in Genesis chapter one, verse 28, which says, then God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, 
and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Amen. So that's basically if you were to just grab uh, the main concept of what that verse is trying to imply is that not only did God create us to have relationship with him, but also to be responsible and to rule over the kingdom that he had actually built for us and also for him as well to enjoy, to rule over, to multiply as well. So that was our, that was our original, how can you say this? That was our original mandate as people of God in terms of living and propagating the kingdom of God. Okay. And so I mentioned earlier that we see in the book of Genesis, the early earliest origins and birthing of the kingdom of God on earth being birthed just by his word. So we all remember how Jesus, uh, God had spoken life through the earth, which was originally formless and without void. Right. And just with his word, he actually made manifest life. He made manifest the oceans, the, the earth, the sea, the garden, and also mankind, which was created after his own image. And if we were to sort of reflect on that a bit more, we are actually bear the likeness and image of God because we are created by him after his own image. Amen. So we bear God's likeness because we are made in his own image. And the, this was God's original plan for us as his creation, to subdue the earth and to rule and to have dominion over all the living things, right? And we were originally given that mandate to obviously rule, take ownership of God's creation with his permission as well. And this essentially is what God's will was for our lives during that time when he established um, the earthly kingdom on earth. But of course, we know that um, there was the fall of man, as you're all familiar of, that, you know, we had came, Adam and Eve had come into agreement with this, with Satan's lies and now our rulership and kingdom reigning has been tainted or we sort of have given away our rulership and our, I guess, yes, our rulership more towards the devil or towards Satan, which God really, which is not what God really intended, right? But nevertheless, this is how things had um, come to be. And of course, you know, Satan who had actually planted that seed of doubt into Adam and Eve, right? And he made them question if what God really planned and made for them for in regards to ruling over the, all the things of the earth and as well as having dominion and having a life in abundance with him, He's making them question if it was actually good or not, you know. So that's what the that's what the devil is always trying to do with us as humans and also us as followers of Christ. Amen. Um, he will often be the one trying to plant that seed of doubt and essentially cause you to fall into sin or to fall short, okay? So let's just be aware of that. Um, and the take-home note here that we can sort of get from all of this in this slide is that we, we actually see throughout the Old Testament of the continuous gradual decline of man drawing away from God due to sin as well as coming to agreement with the enemy. Okay, uh, we see that obviously when, you know, when Adam and Eve, it started when they ate from the tree of the, uh, knowledge of good and evil, and then to Cain and Abel, 
And then it essentially since started becoming more prominent during the Old Testament that it became more harder and harder for us to truly believe and to fully understand what our original uh, mandate was, which was to rule and have dominion over God's kingdom on earth, right? So just bear that in mind that, you know, we see a lot of the examples in the kings in the Old Testament as well. Um, so a lot of the kings, although they were, you know, appointed by God and appointed by the prophets during that time, some of them did well. Others actually repeated the sins of their forefathers. And so the cycle of sin just kept perpetuating and kept just repeating over and over again, right? So the devil was literally constantly having his way with man because man had already come into agreement with Satan to the point that it was harder for them to fully hear and understand what God's will and plan is for us originally as his people. Amen. Um, and it's just really called that hardening of man's heart because the hardening had become so strong in um, in us during, well, in the people during the Old Testament, and especially now, that we no longer remembered we, who we were meant to be as children of God, which was to rule and reign on earth along with um, the Father. And we ha you just have to understand that this that Satan's always going to make you doubt and question God's goodness and heart. But it's up to you and it's up to us really to sort of see through that and still choose to look to God despite what, the, what Satan may be saying to you or trying to um, convince you to sort of perceive who God is. But you know who God is because... You, you are a follower of Christ and you, we have been redeemed by Jesus and we also all in our own way are seeking God. Amen. So you just have to understand that we must resist the enemy and not come into agreement with him and only trust and follow what the word of God says in our lives. Okay. And then we also, we come to the next slide where the kingdom is also uh, the, a part of the prophetic fulfillment throughout the Old Testament in, um, during, during before Jesus' um, time, basically, right? So the kingdom of God was actually the pro prophetic fulfillment of God's promises to Israel and the whole world. We see this in the prophets Isaiah and Daniel. Excuse me that foretold of the coming of the Messianic King who would establish God's reign of peace, justice, and righteousness on the earth once again. So, I, again, going back to the origins of the kingdom of God here on earth, God created mankind to rule and reign over the earth, to establish um, ourselves and to rule over all creation. But then again, Satan convinced man that this is actually not, well, it, there's something else that God is trying to lead you towards, but in actuality, that's not the case. He's just deceiving man. And then he is eventually caused mankind to keep believing his lies. Amen. But now the prophets, such as Isaiah and Daniel in the Old Testament, have been prophesying about the coming of Jesus, which essentially when he was being prophesied to come to earth, he would act, his arrival would actually restore the, the kingdom rulership 
that God had originally intended from the beginning of creation. And basically that is just that whole redemptive act that God was already um, planning and preparing so that, you know, we would actually, when the time had come, he would actually be the one to redeem his people once again and restore kingdom rulership and dominion back for, for the kingdom of God. Okay. And so Christ had fulfilled this by inaugurating the kingdom through his life, his death and resurrection, and will consummate it at his second coming. Amen. So we already know that Jesus was sent by God as man, who was already originally God himself, but in the form of man. And this was his one, this was God's, this was God's um, final redemptive plan that, you know, he, he desperately, or he, he, I guess he's really passionate about redeeming his people back to him because so long has it been throughout history and throughout the Old Testament that man had just drawn away from God, you know, and have lost their identity in who they are in God and what their actual purpose is, right? Because Satan's already whispered so many doubt and lies among his people among God's people that you know it's caused a lot of confusion and also a lot of faltering in us as humans and us as followers of Christ. So um that's basically what Jesus had come to accomplish and he did accomplish and we we should be all eternally grateful for. Um I'll just go towards the passage of scripture in Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 this is just going to I guess emphasize the prophecy that Jesus was the coming Messiah that would restore the his people back to God it says here that therefore the Lord will give you a sign behold the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel which means God with us amen so this is the prophet Isaiah during way before Jesus' time. He had received the, the word from God that this is his master plan. And this is how it's going to be. And we already see in the gospels that, you know, this actually came to pass. And so Jesus had became, had been sent down from the kingdom of heaven by God to be fully man, to become the living sacrifice for our sins, as well as being the bridge and the gateway between us and the Father, and ultimately the kingdom of God and its resources. Okay? So Jesus' act of redeeming us once again, not only for restoring the dominion back to God for his kingdom, but also restoring our connection and our relationship to God, the father and to us as mankind, us as mankind created in his image, restoring that original connection, that relationship that God had intended when God created us in the beginning. Right. And that was in walking with God, having dominion, as well as having unlimited resources of the kingdom, okay? And then we go to the next slide here. It just basically emphasizes the definitions of what is the kingdom, okay? So this is just a brief summary, but what, what is the kingdom? The kingdom is basically the rule of Jesus Christ on earth and in heaven, the blessings and advantages that flow from living under Christ's rule and the subjects of this kingdom or the church. So that's in, that uh, refers to us as a corporate body of the church 
and all the other churches as well on earth. So, so we see here in just the couple of people in the Bible that were speaking about the kingdom of heaven and God in the gospels. Okay. So one of them was John the Baptist, which he was constantly preaching and saying to people to repent for the kingdom of heaven is near is in Matthew chapter three, verse two. And also Jesus himself was the one speaking about the kingdom of heaven. He was also re um, referring and also repeating what um, John the Baptist was saying, which is the kingdom of God is near repent and believe. We, we noticed that, you know, that was the common thing that the John the Baptist as well as Jesus was preaching when they were walking the earth, right? To repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. What are they what what is what are they trying to emphasize here basically? What basically what it is is Jesus Christ, who is God made as man, is actually the kingdom of God being available and actually being made manifest in physical human form. That's Jesus. That They're referring to Jesus Christ right there. Now, Jesus is referring to himself here because the kingdom of God is near because he will be the one that will be restoring the dominion and the rulership back to God, which the, Satan was trying very hard to um, stop and hinder, right? But Jesus, the time had come that, that Jesus had actually came down to earth and he's saying that the kingdom of God is near and that we should, uh, they should repent and believe. Amen. So in the book of Matthew as well, which um, it says a lot of the, it mentions a lot of about the kingdom of heaven in the book of Matthew and Jesus is also uh, teaching his disciples how to pray uh, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 10, which we'll go into a bit later in the next slide, as well as in Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 and 10, which is, I'll just read this briefly, that blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And it also says in verse 10, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then we also read in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21, that not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Amen. So this will be our, those verses here mentioned, will be most of our main focus in trying to understand the, relation to the kingdom of heaven or in relation to the kingdom of heaven and how it relates to us in today's age as Christians and how we can apply the kingdom principles in our lives and help propagate the kingdom of heaven coming down to earth. Amen. So let's dive into our main verse, which is in Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 to 13. Now, you're all familiar with this. This is the Lord's Prayer. Now, just read this very briefly. So it says here, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. It's such a really beautiful and uh, very straightforward prayer, right? Uh, Jesus is trying to teach his disciples how to pray during these times. That the kingdom is actually here now. And Jesus is giving them the template. Okay, and I'm sure that 
the fact that Jesus was preaching or was telling them how to pray, he was also praying the same prayer himself, even though he was God, right? But because he had to come down as man, he had to demonstrate to us as humans how to live in true alignment and obedience with God. And so this, this is a very important um, aspect to get just to grab a hold of, if anything. Okay. We all know that also prayer it has this direct link towards the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus actually mentions it very um, clearly here in the prayer that, you know, that he, he wants, he prays that God's will would be done and his kingdom will come on earth as it is in heaven, which is what he was already being sent down on earth for. But he was also being sent down on earth to show and to demonstrate what the kingdom of God is through his life. Okay. So all, all of these points here in the, um, the Lord's prayer actually are very much relatable in our daily lives, in our daily situations as people, as well as disciples of Christ today. Okay. So we see here in the, in the aspect of uh, the praying for giving us this day, our daily bread, we can sort of understand, well, we can sort of relate that to us be having the gift of life in the present moment. So every morning that we wake up, you know, we, we should, we're, we should always be grateful because, you know, we have another day. Amen. We, we are given this gift of life. We have given this, we have been given this moment right now and having breath that this is not possible without God. And th that's basically what Jesus is trying to emphasize that we need to ground ourselves by understanding that this is the, the life that we have is definitely is a gift from God himself and that the, his daily provision for our lives are always going to be there because that's what the kingdom of God is all about. Okay. The kingdom of God is not about lack, about, you know, being short or anything like that. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is full of abundance and full of blessing, whether it be physical and spiritual. God has all of that in mind and he wants us to have and experience that in our lives okay we also read you know as it says here that as we we ask for forgiveness from god for our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and if you, if i was to summarize this it's basically just what the kingdom of God is trying to emphasize more about in regards to God's characteristics of having cyclical forgiveness, un unending or unlimited forgiveness. Uh, even though we are the most decrepit, the most horrible human beings that we have, capability of becoming and that we fall short numerous times but yet god in his unlimited boundless mercy he forgives us nonetheless and he was able to show and demonstrate that through sending his son jesus and so with that in mind we have to be aware that we should also Forgive those who sin or cause ill will against us. Amen. Because we can't, us as humans, we, all, we always want to have, whenever we feel wronged, whenever we face injustice, the common thing that us as humans want or desire most is to have vengeance. Okay. 
and that that's just not that's just human that's just the natural way that we think as men and women okay but god is really trying to redirect our focus by pointing towards the kingdom and what it's all about and what the kingdom is all about is full forgiveness of our sins and by that us being forgiven we are also able to have the ability to forgive those who cause ill will against us. Because at the end of the day, we are not, we are most certainly not perfect, but we are being made perfected through Christ. Amen. We are always going to fall. So therefore, it is important for us as in the context of being human, to understand that we are not perfect and we have to have the capability and the capacity to perpetuate that cycle of forgiveness. Because if we don't, I think it's basically just going to be for our own, going to be our own self detriment if we don't perpetuate that cycle of forgiveness. Because it's really God's trying to fully allow you to experience the fullness of the kingdom. But if we are in the way of that by not showing forgiveness, then we have to just ask the question, you know, maybe it's something that we have control of and that we need to deal with. And so we just give it to God. Amen. And now the other thing that I want to highlight in this uh, passage of scripture is the, where it says here that, you know, Jesus says, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Okay, it's, it's very straightforward, right? But if we look more closely, there's also a message that Jesus is trying to portray here in that very small passage in the prayer. That God, Jesus is asking God to give us guidance out of temptation and deliver us from evil. Now we all know that it is inevitable for us to avoid sin, temptation, because again, we were born, we were born sinful. Amen. That's the reality. We were we were originally created in God's image, but because of the fall of man, we were born into sin. But now Jesus is giving us the blueprint on how to navigate ourselves back to righteousness. And that's by praying to God to give us guidance out of temptation and deliver us from evil. And you also notice that Jesus doesn't say to take away the evil from our lives, but to deliver us from evil. So what, what does that mean, basically? I'll touch more into this right now. Basically, evil is not for us to conquer on our own. Amen? Neither is it God's will for us to be led into temptation. So we need to understand that, or we need to distinguish that key fact there, okay? Sin and evil is not for you to conquer on your own. And it's not God's will for you to be led into temptation. We, are se we ourselves, having been created by God with free will, have the choice to either choose self or to choose God. And God will always deliver us from evil if we choose to turn to Him. Okay? He's not going to tell you to turn to Him. He will, he will only tell you, to, He will only suggest to you that He's there but it's up to you at the end of the day whether or not you want to turn to him when you face these temptations and trials in your life or you want to do things your own way. Okay, so you always have a choice. He will use what was used against you for evil into something good. Okay, so that's where the, the concept of Jesus praying to lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. Okay, we need to be, we need to go and experience evil or 
temptation in order for us to not not for us to be made low or to experience bad experience a bad life right but it's it's the main purpose of this is to overcome to overcome and to trust god completely okay so you you like i said earlier you can't do this on your own it's you need the help of god and he's there to deliver you from temptation and you and it's important to understand that you actually have to go through temptation in order for you to move and grow in your walk with god okay this is very important if it was if it was the other way around where this wasn't part of the uh prayer and jesus just omitted omitted this so it wasn't um you know mentioned our life would definitely be so much easier amen that you know temptation well we don't have to deal with it because it's not there right but due to the current state of mankind and due to the redemptive power of Jesus and why he had to come down to earth he's given us the the hope and also the perspective once again to look towards the kingdom and know and understand that we are not bound by sin anymore but we are we have the power and ability to be delivered from it by just trusting in God and looking to him okay um so he will deliver you from evil but it's up to us to choose to do so and to turn to him for strength for only he can deliver us from it and not from our own works or deeds amen and then we also hear see here in the last few passages on the prayer that the for yours is the kingdom the power and the glory forever amen that's really i know that's probably nothing it it seems like it's something so small but if you really read just read it and just think about it for a second. Those are actually the three pillars of God's kingdom and God's rulership in the kingdom of heaven, that the kingdom itself, the power and the glory is God's forever and ever. It's not Satan's because he never had authority. He only had authority over hell. He was given that authority because he chose to he chose to fall and to be more like God. So God gave him what he wanted, but in the wrong, in the wrong sense, if that makes sense. Amen. But we, are, we have to understand here that God is still in control. Uh, God's rulership on earth and in heaven consists of the kingdom, the power, and the glory. And those are the most powerful things that we as believers can really just put our trust in in our daily lives okay and then so we move into the next uh the next point here which is the that you are the bearer of the kingdom of heaven now as we pray the lord's prayer as mentioned before you tap into the infinite abundant and overflowing richness an incomprehensible vastness of god's kingdom i know i said a lot of very difficult words there but just basically what i mean with that is that whenever we pray to god or whenever we pray the lord's prayer we are actually reconnecting our our spirit and our lives to the infinite possibility of the kingdom of heaven and just praying and seeking out that it would be made manifest in our lifetime here on earth okay and that in his kingdom there is power there is healing there is forgiveness of sins there is lasting riches everything you can think of that god has created and has been made manifest is available for us so everything that 
you can think of that is for your own good and for your own benefit, God already had that in mind for you. And it's really up to us to really tap into that. We have to tap into we have to tap into it in our minds, our consciousness, as well as in our hearts. So it, it, those, those three things are actually, I guess, intertwined into how we should tap into the kingdom's resources in the kingdom of heaven. Amen. And when we do do that, you, you'll watch how God will move in your life and see his hands work wonders as you declare God's kingdom to be made manifest here on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. So the, the other passage of scripture here, it says here in Luke chapter 17, verses 21, it says here, nor will they say, see here or see there, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you. Amen. So what does that mean when it says the kingdom of God is within you? And how does that apply to us? When Jesus begins to take primary captainship over our lives through the Holy Spirit, our lives begin to take on a transformative process. So we experience a transformation in our lives when we start to make Jesus Lord over our life and to just submit to him. Where what we thought was right or good for us or what we desired initially doesn't compare to what he has planned and purpose for us. And what he has for us is actually exceedingly and far more greater than what we could ever imagine. So in terms of the whole transformative process that we experience when we let Jesus take captainship over our lives, our old self, self is stripped away and our new being is being formed through him. Amen. So we are becoming transformed into more like Christ, basically. And God wants to bring us to that place. If only we choose to seek him and tap into his kingdom. It is also through this process that we begin to experience righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, which is in Romans chapter 14 and verse 17 which is basically a new way of living under the authority and rulership of Christ in the heavenly kingdom. Amen. So whatever bad experience or whatever difficult season that you or any, someone that you know is experiencing right now, just, just remember to Tap into the Holy Spirit and the kingdom from within. Amen. As we read in Luke 17, 21, the kingdom of God is within us. So not only is there a kingdom of heaven, right, which God resides in, but the kingdom of God also is within us. And what that basically means is that we have access to it. And whether or not we utilize that information or access it on a regular basis, that's essentially up to you. But understand that this, the kingdom of God is actually within you. Amen. It is within our grasp. And we have to reach out for it and desire it in faith that it will be made manifest in our life, whatever that we are seeking for, seeking after from God in the kingdom. We have to look from within. Start from within. Because the kingdom of heaven is actually within you. It's within me. It's within you. It's within all of us here. Amen. And we really have to through this scripture and through what Jesus has done and demonstrated in his life, that is basically all that he's trying to demonstrate to mankind that you actually have the kingdom of God within you. 
And that no matter what sin, no matter what trial or situation that you are faced with, that you might seem is very overwhelming or impossible to overcome, trust me when I say that there is nothing impossible with God. And the fact that the kingdom of God is within you, the answer that you are already trying to look for is within your grasp. Amen? And that is all what the kingdom of heaven is all about, is having the kingdom resources and God's will in the kingdom to be made manifest here on earth as it is in heaven. Okay? And then we it brings us here to the next chapter, this next passage of scripture, which is in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, which you're, I'm sure you're all aware of. It says that to, but, for, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Amen. It's a very straightforward scripture, right? It's, but it's also very, very easily looked, looked past or very easily disregarded sometimes. Amen. If we can be honest, right? Um, Jesus is really telling us here the real, the key to obtaining and achieving what we desire and pray for according to God's will. And what is that key? It is by seeking to seek. The, the act of seeking is actually an act of faith as well. That, you know, within the context of seeking God and the kingdom, amen. Because when you start to, I guess, dissociate yourself from seeing what you actually see in reality to then seeking out what the kingdom reality is, that in itself is an act of faith. And from that, you are also taking part in building more and more your growth in your faith walk with God. And it also just allows you to be in true alignment with Him. Okay? So God really wants us to seek him earnestly in life. Not only did he create us in his image and to rule and to have dominion over the earth, but he also wants us to seek him. Because not only does he want us to bless he not only does he want to bless us, but he also wants us to grow and experience life and abundance with him as he intended in the beginning with Adam and Eve. He wants to establish that relationship again, and he did establish that relationship again through Jesus Christ by dying on the cross and paying for our sins. Amen. And so how do we, how do we personally seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness? In our in today's in our time today, it's really just through seeking Him through His Word, one, and as well as through Jesus's life and example, which is found in the Word as well. Amen. And I'll just read here in Hebrews chapter twelve, verses two, and it's this 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 sort of connects, but it it's also has a a different angle on what Jesus had accomplished and what he was sent here for in how he is to demonstrate how we should live in the kingdom. And it says here, looking unto Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Amen. Other translations of that passage says that Jesus was the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. And so it just sort of goes back to what I mentioned about seeking God and just 
really seeking after his righteousness is essentially um is essentially embodying what Jesus had already demonstrated when he was alive amen and that he was actually the author and finisher of our faith and that he he made it possible for us to see him or for he made an example for us to see that it was possible for us as mankind to be made righteous and to seek God once again, despite us always falling short. Jesus' life was the prime example of a man after God's own heart, but also a man who walked with God and demonstrated to us that it is possible to live a life that is authentic and that is in unison with God. True alignment with his will and discovering and enjoying life according to his plan and purpose. Amen. So that's what I sort of was touching base uh, not too long ago about Jesus' life being the prime example of for us to follow. Amen. And so if we ever feel stuck and unsure or uncertain how to live according to God's will, or if we having trouble seeking his kingdom and his righteousness, we really just have to look to Jesus. We have to look at the example that he gave to his disciples during his time and really just grab hold of what he was actually trying to say as well as what he was trying to portray that the kingdom of God is through his life. Cause we often us as, as human beings, we, we look for external solutions. Amen. Like, and we also look for quick fixes because we, it's just natural for us to, well, it's been the common practice for us now to look for um, solutions externally that will cause us to have momentary comfort. But at the end of the day, sometimes we feel like we want more. So we're not being content, basically. But when we seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, that frame shift and alignment shift from looking outside for value and validity to seeking the kingdom, the things we desire will actually be added to us, but in a way that we cannot comprehend or measure because that's how God moves and God shows his love to those who earnestly and diligently seek him and those who walk with him. So not only do you grow and develop in your faith and in your relationship with God, the fact you that you seek him first before seeking what you desire, he will grant you that which you need because of your active obedience and faith in walking with him. The key here is to walk with God and seek him. After that, he will bless you when you do so. Amen. So you have you will start to see your life change and it will actually trickle down to your first for first and foremost in your own life and then to your family, to your relationships and then also branch out to your communities and churches as well. Amen. So that's when we truly seek God in his righteousness. Then it will eventually reach nations because of our one act of obedience in seeking first the kingdom of God. So it's like a cascading effect, basically. So once you start seeking God for yourself and in, in his righteousness, all these things will be added unto you. And then it will start to, I guess, reach other people through your example in your life. And so we often, the question that we often ask ourselves as well is that, you know, why is, Sometimes life so difficult, you know, or why am I not getting my breakthrough? 
Amen. It's something that we have all come across or have experienced, but we just have to really ask the question that, am I seeking God personally and deeply enough? Or am I just seeking the external stuff and then looking for God in those things? Because we often get impatient, right? And we often go with our own way and try to do things our own way, dealing with situations. But God is really simply asking us and yourself to just trust him and to seek him. And when you do, it will come to you. So you don't need to worry, okay? Whether it be financial breakthrough, relational breakthrough, employment breakthrough, spiritual breakthrough, healing breakthrough, all these things will be added onto you. Not some or a few, right? But all these things. Amen? It says here, right? All these things will be added onto you. But first, the thing that we need to do first is to seek. Amen? When we seek first the kingdom of God, we are prioritizing God's values and principles in every aspect of our lives. Excuse me. We make decisions that align with God's will, as well as cultivating spiritual disciplines, which include prayer, study of scripture, participation in commu church Christian community, which is our church. And basically, that's all it is, right? We, we must seek God, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Amen. And then this will be the last passage of scripture here, which is in Romans chapter 14, verse 17 and 19, which says here, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing God and receives human approval. Let us, therefore, make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. So the kingdom of God is not bound by what our carnal body does or what it desires, right? Our physical bodies, meaning. But it's actually more grounded in righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And so this passage of scripture is very important in having the important grounding of us as believers and us as being bound by the kingdom of God, okay? This verse also emphasized the importance of seeking after and prioritizing the kingdom principles in our lives because when we do this, not only does it please God, but, when, but we in turn get validation and approval from man in the same way and not the other way around where we're seeking and pleasing God through the approval of man. So what I mean by that is we're not seeking for the approval of man. And when we do seek, seek it that way, then that's when we know that God is pleased with us. But it's actually the other way around. When we, when we please God through our lives, by following the kingdom principles and living righteously and seeking him, then people will actually notice and actually commend your life for being righteous and being authentic within your faith and in how God had intended for you to live. And it will start to, catch on to them, right? Like they, they'll probably want to ask, what, tell me your secret, you know? And then that's when you start reconnecting other people back to God, amen? That's how you start having that cascading effect of making the kingdom of heaven come down to earth. So in summary, our take-home notes today, and we are finished now, that... The kingdom of God is here and now. It is within all of us. Amen. The kingdom of heaven can be made manifest in our lifetime and in our reality 
by being in alignment with the Father and tapping into the limitless power and abundance of the kingdom in our own lives. And from that, it's enabling the kingdom coming down to earth as it is in heaven. We are also the direct link and vessels of the kingdom of heaven through our relationship with Jesus and the Father and under the guidance of the Holy Spirit within us. Also, Jesus has overcame hell in darkness and has taken back the keys. And now, yet from that, through his sacrifice, his resurrection, he has restored rulership and dominion back to the kingdom of God. And that's that that reason itself causes for a big celebration for us as believers. Because we are no longer bound by the kingdom of darkness or sin, but we are restored once again by the kingdom of God. And also, the last point here is that Jesus will be coming again to complete the establishment of the kingdom from heaven onto earth. But it is up to us to propagate and build towards that while we are still alive. Amen. So the, the thing that I want to emphasize in that last point is that we are not waiting around to have the kingdom be made manifest here on earth. We're, we're, we're not waiting. We are going to be actively seeking and actively propagating the kingdom of God from within us to, uh, throughout the world and throughout everybody that we encounter. Amen. And from there, when we do achieve that, I truly believe that Jesus will come once again and fully, firmly establish the kingdom of heaven back here on earth as he originally intended. Amen. So I hope that you are blessed. And that's all that I have for today's message. And I'll just pray simply to close. So dear Heavenly Father, we just want to honor you and thank you once again for this time. We thank you that you have sent Jesus Christ down to earth to not only die for our sins, but to also, Lord God, restore the dominion and the rulership back to your kingdom, God. And that, Lord, you have given us the power once again to be able to propagate your kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. May you just continue to guide us in our daily walk, in our lives, and to truly seek you above everything, Lord God. And give us the discipline and the, the strength to be able to just go after you, to spend time with you, and to truly seek within ourselves what your kingdom has in store for us, Father. And I just pray for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So thank you, everyone, once again. I hope you are blessed. And it has been such an honor and privilege to be sharing the word of God with you this morning and God bless you all. Paul. So thank you so much, brother you. Giorgio for uh, today's message. It was wonderfully presented and we know that uh, the Holy spirit have guided you all through the topic of uh, thy kingdom come. And now it is about time that we all will be ready to appropriate the message that was brought to us that we now understand what it is about the kingdom of God and that we have a duty of care, us all saints, to continue to shine, spread the gospel about this kingdom. And we all know who the kingdom of God is. It is that within us, Jesus Christ, and everything about him that we should be bold to share, we should be rejoicing to share, we continue to endure to the end, to serve him, to love him, and honor him all the days of our lives. And let his kingdom come. Let his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thank you so much, our online viewers. We thank God that you are, are here, have been with us this an hour or so from this topic. 
We so appreciate you. We thank God for you. We continue to do this as you know, we await, all await the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for uh, tuning in. And we hope that you will continue, continue to pray with us, support us, get to uh, visit our website, christisthehead.fellowship.com. And you can just go to that and look at what the Lord is doing in our platform as he deems uh, fit and will. Thank you so much. And this is now Sister Annie Regalisa signing off. The overhead, overseer oversee head of Christ is the head fellowship. And thank you so much, Brother Giorgio Regalisa. God bless you all. And thank you so much. And again, let Christ be the head of all of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen.